That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish us. Seriously? Don't. Don't. Oh, my God. That's good. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. You, you probably, probably should find a hobby. You ever, you ever want to discuss that? Stop. Be happy. Quit while you're in the don't. Don't bother me. I've seen good people. Do you really want to do And grow my third grade. Give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to Horrible Writing. I'm your host, Paul Sadie, and along with me, we're going to do another uh, author interview. This one is going to be very interesting from me, and I can't wait to see your reaction. I have with me none other than Andy Peliquin, who is a fantasy writer. Hero of Darkness series is how I discovered him and his process, and I couldn't read enough of his updates of what he did in this series. We're going to talk about that here, but for those of you who focus on the can't of publishing I have a feeling, I'm going to set Andy up for success with this one. I have a feeling he's going to show you how you can. Andy, welcome to Horrible Writing. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, man. That interview is just like building me up, and now I'm going to say a bunch of stupid stuff, and it's going to be a total <laughs> letdown to your listeners. So listeners, I apologize in advance. <laughs> I, I will fa- I will own that all myself. Don't don't send Andy any hate mail. S- send it all to me. <laughs> um, but Andy, I really think your, your past year is just absolutely phenomenal the the thing that gets me excited and has had me excited to talk to you since you accepted this invite was that i personally got to s- almost kind of see your journey uh, we we happen to know each other on facebook and i so i got to see a lot of your updates and writers groups as you were going into this and it was just amazing to watch it happen and i thought he's got a secret but you shared it so you didn't keep it secret but it was so <laughs> empower- empowering because it was doable So I want to talk about that. You were totally cool with opening up about it. And you called this, this thing, this concept, hardcore writing. What in the world is hardcore writing? Oh, hardcore writing is tough. It's just this sort of unending nonstop creation, this drive. So to put it into context in the last five months, I've written five novels between 120 and 140,000 words. And it's just sitting down, you know, butts in seats, fingers on the keyboard, writing your heart out all day, every day, uh, or, you know, as much time as you can fit in, having a plan beforehand and just working at it till it's done. That's amazing. I I knew you were prolific. I had no idea the level of uh, your output. You're, are you doing this full time? Uh, right now, as of about mid year, I'm doing it uh, most time. I'd say eighty percent of the time. So both my wife and I are very cautious people. So I have retained some of the day job. Yes, um, yeah. work just in case you know as a fallback. Uh, but but yeah, I'm working about eighty percent of the time. So I do most of my day job stuff Mondays and Tuesdays, and I'll fit in um, about a two hour afternoon writing shift from three to five, give or take. And then now it's been some days I have to work Wednesday morning, and I'll only fit two writing shifts in. Uh, if I'm on a real like deadline time crunch, like the next couple of weeks, I'll do three, and then. Thursdays and Fridays are all day. That's some absolutely amazing. It is. I want. I want to explore that a little bit later with you. But I want folks to kind of understand the man behind the concept and the man behind the ability to do that. And I don't want to answer for you. I've got my three D theory of you know discipline, dedication, and drive. But I want to hear it from you. Is is that who you've always been? Somebody who could you know butt and seat and and for two days full on straight or the guy who could pump out five books in five months, or is that something that you developed and how did that come about? You know, my mom has this story. She loves to tell about me uh, so much so that I actually wrote it into one of my, into my recent novels, just sort of as an homage to her where when I was two or three years old, uh, I I would go to this park and there was this 
fake tree that's like a climbing obstacle and i would run at it and try to climb it and fail miserably and i just kept doing it for i don't know a few weeks or a few months i was i was three years old i have no idea how long this lasted <laughs> uh, until i eventually climbed it so she's always like to say that you know once i set my mind to stuff i can do it but you know to be honest i didn't always have what i wanted to do clear you know i i've bounced back and forth between different careers i had a career in sales i traveled a lot i um i was an english teacher i did a lot of things and then i discovered uh, blogging, copywriting, and I found I was good at it. I didn't necessarily enjoy it, but I was good at it. I could do it, so I, it started paying the bills, and I was happy so I could work from home. Uh, and then I fell into writing sort of organically because I wrote a lot uh, when I was younger. Uh, for school, I got a, a, a couple of projects done in my teens, and then uh, in my mid-20s, um, a friend of mine who has a publishing company, she said, hey, this stuff, you know, I sent her something. She loved it. She wanted to publish it. And so I was like, okay, well, if if she likes this so much, maybe I could still do it. You know, I'm seven, eight years older than I was before. I got to be able to do something better. So I sat down um, over the course of a trip, a holiday vacation that I spent a weekend with my brothers. I went to visit Vancouver, actually. And, you know, when I was sitting on the on the airplane in the airport waiting for the bus, us, uh, you know, just I just wrote a story, and so it it came out. I think I only put down about thirteen thousand words, but that was the first story that I had written since uh, the age of seventeen, eighteen, and and I loved it. I just loved creating this thing. So then I started writing more and more and more, and the more I wrote, the more I realized how much I just absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm. So realizing that was like, all right, this is something I want to do. But as a man with the family you can't really, you know, do it as a hobby if you want to do it full time. You got to turn it into an actual business. Mm-hmm. So in order, to, you know, there was sort of this this moment when I realized, okay, I want to do this for a living, and that's when it sort of clicked that I'm going to have to work a lot harder than I was at the beginning to make it happen. Mm-hmm. So part of it sounds nature, but also we've got to give you your due. I mean, this isn't something that um it, you didn't do without thought and in uh, a lot of probably blood, sweat, and tears. I want to talk to you about um, some advice that you would give to others. But before we hit on that, I kind of want them to, you know, kind of lead themselves in determining their own fate, if you will. From your experience, go, from that three-year-old climbing, the, trying to climb <laughs> the tree, to the to the the guy who's writing five books in five months. Um, that's hardcore. That's a, that is intense. Talk to us about your experience. What are, what would you determine some of the costs that people would need to think about? And then of course we want to really hit them on the positive side. What are the benefits of this, this focused drive, this, this hardcore writing tactic? All right. Well, I'd say the number one cost, aside from the money, you know, that you're going to spend on editors and covers and all of that, the number one cost is the the exhaustion, the stress. Um, the truth is, since I arrived in Canada at the end of May, it's been pretty nonstop for me. Where I think I've taken a couple of weeks off of work, a couple of weekends to to you know just decompress with the family, but the rest of the time it's been very very long weeks and and. The thing that a lot of people don't understand about writing stories is that it's more than just, you know, crunching numbers in a computer or shoveling or hauling or, you know, whatever the job is that you do. There is a certain amount of physical exhaustion that goes into almost every job, but the mental exhaustion of creating is so much more than than most people will ever realize. And I would say that's probably the number one toll that I'm feeling right now. You know, I'm I'm coming to the end of the marathon, let's say, you know, I'm I'm finishing the fifth book, hopefully by next weekend, so I can take Christmas off. But during that weekend, you know, I, that week is just going to be absolutely no computer, no writing, nothing, because my brain feels very drained. Mm-hmm. Uh, just from it's just this intense, consistent focus on a story. You know, you've you've built this world, you've built these characters, you've built this setting, this scenario, all these battles and trials and tests and emotional difficulties, and then you've got to bring them through this journey. And that takes a lot more concentration than people realize. So that's probably the the number one cost of of hardcore writing is just this drain that you that you feel on your on your mind. And I wouldn't say my spirit because I'm, you know, I'm I'm loving this. I'm loving the fact that I can 
put these new stories out there, but my brain is definitely feeling like it needs a break. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and that, as you were answering that, I was jotting down a note because I have to know for somebody to put out as much as you have. And n- now knowing that you've got five more in, in the works, what do you do to stay mentally fresh? How do you do that? Or how do you, you reinvigorate? Know, I- maybe might be a better, more appropriate question. Well, the truth is I haven't stopped long enough to to have to re anything. You know, okay. <laughs> when you when you're just going, you don't really slow down and stop. So it's always been like like my the process for me is I write a book, I send it off to the beta readers, I write the next book, send that off to the beta readers, take the fir- the previous book, make the edits, send it off to the editor, and then work on the next book. Mm-hmm. So I've always got these, you know, all these pieces in motion. So when I'm finished writing book three, I'll send it to the better readers, fix the book two according to their notes, send it off to the editor, edit book one according to the editor's note, and then start working on book four. So it's this sort of nonstop cycle, mm-hmm. um, the back and forth. So I've always got something going on. It sort of helped me to keep things going. And then, of course, knowing that I had a, a very specific launch date in mind, knowing that I was about to hit Christmas and my wife wants to take a week off and I definitely need a week off. So mm-hmm. uh, it, I haven't really stopped long enough to feel for it, to, let's say, to come down from the emotional or the the high of of the creativity, but I know that when um, what I do take time off is just going to be like my brain's going to collapse a little bit and I'll yeah. be a, a vegetable for a week. <laughs> oh no, and justifiably so. You you probably play video games or something for a week straight. Do nothing that requires thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I the thing actually that really helps me a lot is is TV. So mm-hmm. I can't read a lot because I get super critical. You know, when when you're editing your book, you look for the mistakes, and so it's hard to shut that part of your brain off. Yes, when you're reading other people's stuff, you know, when you're reading Brandon Sanderson, when you're reading David Weber, you can be like, all right, these guys are masters of their craft. You know what you're they know what they're doing. But when I read my fellow, you know, my friends, they send me their books to read. It's really hard to shut off that part of the brain. But TV has really helped me to do that because uh, mm-hmm. I don't have to think about it. I can just sort of enjoy it. But then it's it's really given me an insight into into other characters, into other uh, ways of structuring stories. You know, I've started structuring my novels a bit more like a TV show in the sense that each chapter has an ending that leads into the next. Uh, there's this there's a hook that gets you to want to continue. Yes, and and I've actually learned a lot about story and characters and people overall from watching TV. So it's a really nice mix of relaxation and sort of research. No, and that and that's a great point. That is an excellent point. And I find myself doing I find myself finding that helpful as well. And it's funny you brought up the hypercriticalness. I actually for the first time gave up on a fantasy writer who I have loved for I don't know, 15 years uh, because within the past 3 months I'm now editing my fourth book and within the past three months, like you were talking about with that super critical brain and you can't shut it off kind of thing. I got 90 pages into his novel and it was, it was a, an exertion of faithful servitude to get 90 pages. It was hard to make it that far. And I ultimately gave up and I've never, I couldn't believe that I set his book down and, 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 so yeah, you're right. You can't shut that off. And it's, it's imperative that we do something for ourselves to kind of do that refresh, especially doing something like you're doing. Now, my fear is that because a, a, a lot of the people who listen to this show, I mean, there's a good number of published authors, but there are a lot of people who have that fire burning. They believe they want to do this one day and some of the people who've done a little more research understand that, hey, this Andy guy's onto something. If you can do this, this is a great way to leverage production to capture some marketplace, which I would like to talk to you about a little bit later here um, in your previous experience. But before we lose them, that, that person that's listening to you and they say, there's no way I can do what he's doing. Um, what would you say to that person besides the obvious answer? Hey, you don't have to do what I'm doing. Is there any (laughs) advice, any, anything that you can kind of reframe this hardcore writing concept into so that they, they could probably interpret it in their own life, in their own schedule? 
Yeah, you know, I think one one thing that a lot of writers do when they're first starting out or when they're sort of learning the the ropes is they'll just write and write and write and write and write and write. They won't stop until they feel drained or they feel their inspiration has run out Mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, I don't do that. I sit down, I write my two chapters for my writing shift, and then I get up and walk away. You know, I'll go cook, I'll go watch TV, I'll take a nap, whatever it is. So that, that it's very goal oriented in that aspect uh, but it's easier to compartmentalize because then it's not like, oh, what's going to come next and what's going to keep happening? You know, I got to keep going because the inspiration's flowing. It's just I need to sit down. I need to write these two chapters and then I can get up and walk away. Mm-hmm. But that's only possible because I've taken the time to at least outline a little bit beforehand so I know where things are going. So that's something that a lot of people can learn to do. A lot of people struggle with outlining. They they prefer to do discovery writing. And I think that can work for a lot of authors, but it's just a habit. You know, a lot of, a lot of authors could probably become outliners Mm -hmm. with a little bit of practice. So outlining is the only reason I will say that I've been able to write these five books in these five months, because I know where every story needs to go. I can keep things on track, or if I do end up deviating because the story is taking me somewhere interesting, I can bring things back where they need to go or find a way to rejigger it so they they get back on course. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason that I can sort of have that peace of mind to get up and walk away uh, at the end of my writing shifts. And it probably provides you with that vision of what's to come. So it's tantalizing you as a creator as well to have it. Absolutely. So just to give us an idea, a little bit of framework, because an outline can, I mean, it's very subjective. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different writers. How detailed are your outlines? Um, So I've got two outlines for every project that I work on. I've got the world building notes, uh, which includes character stuff. It includes uh, everything from government to religion, to language, to currency, uh, to politics, and then I've got the actual story. So in the world building, I'll get as detailed as I need to, you know, to create the cities or um, the structure of the story, the framework that I'm going to fill everything in. But then um, uh, I'll also do a lot of uh, character outlining, or at least a basic understanding of who my characters are, what they want, what they are dealing with, uh, so that when I sit down to write the story, I've got a pretty clear idea of everything. But the story outline itself, like each novel that I outline, it's got enough of the story beats. You know, you've got the beginning, you've got the immediate introduction to conflict, and then there's the next conflict, and then the ultimate, the climax, and the the lead into the next book, and all the pieces in between. I have at least enough of that outlined that I know where the story's going before I sit down to write it. That makes it a lot easier for me to say, okay. I'm going to let my creativity flow. I'm going to enjoy creating the story, taking these characters along the journey, but I know where they need to go. So it'll, it'll help me figure out the best way to get them there. Okay. No. And that's great. And I, and, and listeners, the reason I asked them that was because everybody does have their process and it can mean different things to different people. And I'm not asking all of you to go become like Anthony in your production, but at the same time, I find especially new writers, they, they hit that first bump in the road and it really derails them for months, maybe years at a time. It happened to me myself and I, I empathize when it happens to others. So when I talk to authors like Andy, I want us to to be able to hear what they're saying, but we need to be able to translate it without giving ourselves excuses. We need to be able to translate it to our own method of operating our own own methods and of uh, creating and and processes of creating. Now, Andy, with all of this going on, how do you balance this part of who you are, this creative person you are with all those other aspects of life and only as much as you're comfortable has, has this ever created a a struggle or a strife for you um, that you'd be comfortable sharing, of course. And, you know, what was, that recovery process from that? How do you get back on your groove? So a couple part of question there, but I think it's important for folks to be able to understand um, that even if they do attempt something along this, that, that they could hit that bump and then get right back on that horse as well, that it doesn't have to der- totally derail them for months or years at a time. Yeah. Well, you know, okay. So let's break that into, into two parts. The, the second part we'll start with was the, the strifes. 
right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, there, there have been many times when uh, my wife goes and hangs out with her sister and her family, uh, you know, the, the in-laws, and I know that I need to write so I miss out on a social event. Or next week, uh, I'm contemplating whether or not I can afford taking the week off to go visit family uh, at a family reunion. You know, there's the the fact that you're pushing so hard means you have to sacrifice things, and and oftentimes, unfortunately, that means sacrificing the the people in your life, the activities. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I used to work out four or five times a week. Now I've gone once or twice if I'm lucky, mm-hmm. because you know you only have time and brain power for one passion, one driving thing that consumes your life. So I'm focused on this. Um, there are a lot of ways that 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 thing suffer, but you've got to find that balance in order to make it work. And that's why I have found that dividing my writing into these writing shifts is helpful because I'll work from, from seven to nine in the morning. It's a writing shift. It's two hours. You know, sometimes it'll spill over to nine 30, but then I go upstairs and I cook breakfast for my wife. I have breakfast for myself. I take a few moments off. Maybe I'll watch a, a 20 minute uh, TV show, something funny on Netflix to, to decompress. Mm-hmm. And then I'll get back to work at 10 30 or 11, right till one. And then have lunch again, whether I cook lunch or I just go eat it. My wife's made it. She also works from home. Um, you know, just just step away from the computer for half an hour or something, just to sort of refresh, make sure to to check in there, and then write from three to five. And then at five, I get up and I walk away from my computer, and I don't worry about you know what I have to do tomorrow because I've already taken those notes. I've figured out what I'm mm-hmm. doing tomorrow. I'll have you know my notebook or my phone on me if I have to say, oh, you know, this little bit of story needs to be written in i'll jot down a note but i won't sit back down and write and so being able to do that being able to get up and walk away knowing i did what i needed to do it sort of helped me to keep that uh that part of my life in check yeah that is a that's a great tip tool tactic to listen to again folks if you need to hit the 15 second rewind on your podcatcher do that um i could hear it in your voice andy it was almost that sense of self-satisfaction it gives you that that peace if you will yeah. to keep things balanced and folks that's where the success comes is is when we can find that peace you don't need to be the tortured artist in this <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> it is said that steel wins a man his crown but it is his skill at treachery that helps him keep it. In Alador, men scheme, fight, and die for the right to wear the crown of thieves. This episode of Horrible Writing is brought to you by my newest audio drama and novel series venture called Crown of Thieves, an epic fantasy. This new audio drama is currently in casting as of February 2019 with a spring release for the first episode and is only available to patrons of Paul Sadian Productions. If you're a medieval fantasy fan, you'll definitely want to check this out. All levels of patronage have access to this show as soon as it starts broadcasting from $1 a month all the way up to infinity. Become a patron today Not only will you get this show, exclusive content of this show, my blogs, Crown of Thieves, you'll also get another audio drama exclusive titled You, and all new fiction short and flash pieces as they're completed. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. Support today and never miss a minute of the epic struggle for the Crown of Thieves. Now, help us understand the torturous aspect of what you do. Earlier on, you mentioned that you had you have to have a plan. And now that I understand the fuller context of what you, you've got coming, I'm really interested to pick your brain on what that looks like for the layman writer or the new writer. If you could take us up to that macro perspective so we can see the whole forest instead of just a single tree, what does Andy's plan look like and, and and how do you structure it and what are some of the things that you consider before those fingers even touch a keyboard 
okay, so usually I know what I'm going to work on before I sit down to write it, you know, weeks or months in advance. Like right now I'm finishing up book five. I've got three wor- three books worth of, of editing and corrections to do, but I already know what I'm going to work on next. So now that, I, that I've got this sort of idea in my head, my brain starts kicking it around in the back of my mind and I'll start coming up with ideas. I'll find something um, that stands out to me. For example, the next series that I'm working on is about is sort of a Roman Legion esque fantasy, and so I was watching a TV show, and there was some off the wall comment about the Roman Legion, and I was like, "Wait a minute, that's actually kind of interesting." Mm-hmm. And so I popped that into my my file of notes. So I've always got this this thing that I'm working on in the back of my brain, taking notes, coming up with ideas, and then once I'm finished with all my projects, it's time to move on. I'll take a couple of days where it's just days to to figure out what I'm going to do. You know, I've got a bunch of notes, uh, story elements, world building elements, things that I find interesting, themes that I'd like to write in, things to consider. And so I'll take a couple of days, sometimes two, three, depending on how long my, my series is to outline. And I'll just put those into a structure, into a story that I think, all right, this is interesting. You know, they've got um, the character arcs. I've got a good you know, introduction, uh, climax, ending, hook that leads into the next book, overall the story, you know, what themes do I want to explore? What elements do I want to fit in? How do I want to, you know, frame this, reveal this, make it an interesting twist? And so I'll have, I'll, I'll take a few days just to plan all of this out in advance. And the, the art of outlining a whole series is definitely an art in itself because you kind of have to stop looking at it chapter by chapter, scene by scene. You have to look at it from the macro. Okay. Is this an interesting story arc overall? How can I make the characters growth mirror the overall story? And so just take those days to figure that out Mm -hmm. so that when it comes time to start writing book one, I know where I need to start. I know that I need to get to X place by the end of book five, six, 10, however many I'm going to write, but book one only needs to go so far. And then after I finish writing the book one, I send it off to better readers. Now, over the course of the story, the the things have deviated a bit from the original outline. You know, you you have to give room for creativity. So I have to take stock of, okay, now maybe one character ended up in a different position or different location that I originally had him or her. What am I going to do? How am I going to adjust? I adapt my outline according to that. Maybe I take into account some of the character growth notes that I didn't originally plan, but they just sort of came about organically through the story. Add those in, make sure that everything's clear, that the characters, that I, you know, I know where the thing's going. And then I sit down to write book two. And it's just sort of a repetition of that process. Okay. Each story is adapting and adjusting to what happened before within the framework that I've laid out. That is neat. Do, are you doing any... While you're going through this process, are you doing any writing in a previous project or are you completely uh, cognitively free to do the planning? Yeah, definitely. I'm very focused, especially right now with this sort of hardcore marathon writing. It's a hundred percent focus on this series. Okay. Uh, yeah. I do have a short story that I need to write in this universe for an anthology and I'm sort of freeing up some brain space for the next project because I'm on the fifth and final book and I know how the story ends. Uh, But up until this week, essentially I had no brain space for anything else. It was all focused on this. No. And that makes sense. I I was curious though, just because of how, um, how hardcore you are if you were able to do that or not, because that would be even more impressive. <laughs> yeah. There, there are some authors who can do that. And for those who can, I tip my hat to you. <laughs> Me, it's all about just focusing on what I'm doing because that's how I, that's how I stay present within the story. And that's how I stay within the character's headspace. And I, you know, I keep things going in my mind and that's what makes the story, the story flow so much better. If I was to jump around a bit, it would be, it would be hard, but I know a lot of authors do it because maybe they get bored with one story or one series or one character. And for me, I just create characters and st- series that I love so much that I just want to keep writing them. So I don't have to worry about jumping around a, bo- a lot. Right. Okay. So <sighs> listeners, I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a second. Cause I've n- never done anything like this, but I'm going to do this with Anthony uh, or Anthony, I'm going to do this with Andy. Sorry for going all <laughs> formal and changing names and everything. Um, because I've never seen 
anything like this in this genre. I'm a huge fantasy geek. I've seen proficiency in romance, but I haven't seen it in anybody else. So, Andy, if you'll bear with me, listeners, bear with me. I'm going to do something really weird here. I'm going to do it as fast as I can. From the start of 2018, January 30th, May 14th, May 27th, June 5th, June 28th, August 1st, August 7th, October 27th, it jumped for some reason, August 21st, September 4th, and September 18th. I just read you the publication dates of Andy's work this year alone. Andy, that is absolutely remarkable. We know you have a plan and you obviously have an airtight process, but the pro your hardcore writing or your hardcoreness goes beyond just writing that it's all encompassing, isn't it? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's writing for a plan. Like, so this five book series that I'm working on now, I know my launch date for book one is January 22nd. I knew that I wanted January before I sat down to write book one. So okay. I knew that I had from July or August when I started until January to get the first three books written because to mirror the success of Hero of Darkness, I wanted to do another rapid release, which mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll get into at some point. Yes. Um, but so I knew what I had to do. So it was just sitting down and saying, okay, to make this work, I've got to write so many books in so many months. How am I going to do that? Let's haul ass and make it happen. So a big part of that is a big part of the hardcore writing is knowing what you're going to do. You know, you know, you want to release five books in a series you get a plan for when you want to release them and then you work to meet that plan instead of just saying, all right, I'm going to write a book and then it turns into a trilogy. And then, Oh, it's turning into five books now, which is what happened with hero of darkness. Originally, okay. there was far less cohesion to it. With uh, and I actually do want to pick your brain as much as you're comfortable sharing again, please. But one of the reasons I was excited and humbled that you accepted the invite to come on is because one of the the tagline from episode one before the show's evolution, when the show started, I was not going to interview authors. I was just going to do kind of like a, a a writer's journey from not knowing a thing to becoming published and have it to be an inspiration. And then I started um, chatting with folks and I just became inspired to talk to other writers on air so that we could meet my mission objective for this podcast is empowerment through candor, just being very okay. real with each other and lifting each other up. And I am current my my a lot of my patrons know this, some of my fans know this, that I'm moving away from horror and thriller, and I'm gonna in, in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, start delving into my first love, which is epic fantasy again. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> but you were a catalyst to that because of what you posted in a number of Facebook groups. You really tried to share your experience with experience with folks to, to help them. So I don't necessarily want to get down into the weeds of the nuts and bolts of the success of Heroes, Hero of Darkness, but as much as you're comfortable sharing, this is an empowerment moment. If people hear what you just said about that process and, and aim and focus and then the dedication to get the butt in the seat and get it done, there was a big payoff for you. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So up until, honestly, up until the middle of this year or the early this year, my name was almost not known at all. It's still not very known, but that's that's a story for a different time. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had I had published, I believe, five books by January 2018 or six books January 2018. And, you know, I had made a few thousand dollars. Hooray over a couple of years. Not great. Not even a little bit. Um, and so I was, I was researching it and I was like, okay, so now there's this story that people seem to love because the reviews have all been very favorable and people have become dedicated fans and they've reached out, when are we going to get the next one? And so I was thinking, okay, now why is the story only connecting with a small number of people? And over the course of the research, I realized that the story wasn't the problem, that it was the covers and the, the packaging essentially. Mm -hmm. So this realization came to me at the end of 2017 and I was thinking, okay, so what I need to do is I need to repackage everything. And so I got the rights back. I reached out to the publisher who was doing the original series, which was called the last Bucellari originally. 
And so I, I got the rights back from them and I was, and I was researching how to make this work. And I ran into what's the, 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 the process of what's called a rapid release where basically you release book one, a week or two later, you release book two, two or three weeks later, you release book three. Like you release a lot of content in a very short amount of time which caters to people who are on Kindle Unlimited and they read a ton at a time. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, you give them more incentive to buy your book, which raises your ranking, which makes it more visible, which means more sales, not only in Kindle Unlimited, but eBooks. And then, you know, it's sort of this cumulative effect where the, the sequels help to drive the original, but not six months to a year later, right then, a week or two later. And so, so when I when I discovered that, it was like, all right, this is a huge gamble that I'm taking, but I'm going to try it. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I had six books in the series. I'd only written four of them at the time, but I knew I wanted to do six. So I sat down and I hammered out the next two over the course of um, what would be February, March, April, give or take. And so I knew that I had everything ready to go. I had the books edited. I got new covers. I had this product ready to roll. And so I spent the time investing in learning how to market and advertise effectively so that when May, which is the date that I had, May 27th, I believe, that was the projected launch date. I knew that when that came around, I would be in the best possible position to make this work. And so that was having that plan in mind, it sort of gave me the drive to say, all right, you're going to have to haul some serious ass to make it happen. And actually the day that I flew from Mexico to Canada to move was the day that the book launched. And so that first day I spent it, you know, in an airplane wondering, is this book tanking? Is it doing well? Are my ads doing anything? Am I spending a bunch of money? Did I, did I waste my life? Am I a failure? (laughs) And then I arrived in Canada, checked my rankings and I, it's the high, it was the highest I'd ever gotten before. And then I kept, you know, over the next couple of weeks, releasing books, two, three, four, and the rankings kept climbing. And so, you know, my goal was like, right, I want to hit number one in my category. Mm -hmm. I will be happy. And I hit number one in my category and then the rankings kept climbing and it kept climbing. I was like, all right, let's keep, let's keep setting higher and higher goals. And so eventually the book peaked at 560 in the entire Kindle store, which for me is absolutely an unbelievable record that I never dreamed of breaking. Yeah. 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 That was amazing. At that same time, wasn't it multiple number one at that time when it hit that like in all three categories? Yeah, well, actually, when it hit that, it wasn't because uh, this friend of mine, uh, he had released a book or actually he released a, a box set, three books at the same time and in the same category. So we we spent a couple of weeks back and forth battling over the number one. It became a whole a whole thing on Facebook where where, <laughs> you know, I would post that I'm the winner and then he would post five minutes later that the rankings had changed and he was the winner. And it was good natured fun. And we sort of continued the rivalry ever since. <laughs> That's um, awesome. <laughs> so so it wasn't number one in, in in like two categories because he had just a slightly higher ranking than mine. Literally he, one time he had one ranking higher than mine. Like mine was six sixty nine and he was six sixty eight or something like just something, you know, but it was, it was fun because my book was doing far better than anything I'd ever believed possible. Yeah. So for me, it was so exciting to see that, okay, this is sort of the formula that worked for this one. And so I'm trying that formula again with this new series to see if I can make lightning strike twice, even to half the degree of the original uh, of hero of darkness. I'll be happy because that's far more success than I had ever dreamed possible before May, 2018. All right. Yeah, I know it was impressive to watch that and very, very inspirational. Um, so I'm, so thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. And it, and to dispel listeners, to dispel, dispel this thing, this bias that we have, that you can only do this in romance. I've been waiting months to get Andy on to prove <laughs> that that wrong, that it can happen for others. And, I, and I'm so happy for you, Andy, because you're one of the good ones because you shared this and you shared a wealth of this information through your experience all over the place as you went through this. And it was very helpful, I know, to hundreds and hundreds of people who saw it back then. So I'm, I'm so grateful for you to share it. Now, I'm so grateful, in fact, 
that I'm going to ask you a question about a horrible writing experience. <laughs> now, if this is your first episode of Horrible Writing, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Even if you're only here to hear Andy talk, that's cool. Maybe I can convince you to hang around after he's gone into the future. But while he's here, you may be thinking, why would a, a host of a podcast ask a guest for something horrible? Here's my thinking. I have no idea what Andy's going to share with us, but in his experience that he's about to share, there's going to be something funny, torturous, embarrassing, humiliating. I don't know, but we know where he is today. We know what he's accomplished. So whatever he's going to share with us now, he has overcome that. He's come through those trials and tribulations, no matter how small, no matter how large, and he's out there at least in a in a great portion of his life living his dream. So this is why we do this, to help empowerment through candor, to help each other see that it is doable. We can do, each and every one of us can do this. So Andy, with that being said, what is your horrible writing experience? So my horrible writing experience is an entire novel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so it was, so, so, uh, Hero of Darkness, what was originally Blade of the Destroyer, it was not actually the first novel I ever released. I released one before called In the Days, and it was set in Atlantis. It was this awesome, you know, Atlantis story. But when I got the reviews for it, a lot of people said the same thing. The story is interesting, but the characters were lacking. There was nothing to really intrigue me or to, to make me interested in the characters. And that was sort of a light bulb moment that I'd spent all this time writing this amazing story, which I still stand by how awesome the story is. And I'm going to turn it into a novel of some sort or take parts of it. I'm going to do something with it and put it in my world. Mm -hmm. But um, to hear this, that, okay, the story is great, but the characters are lacking. It really drove home for me the point that the characters are what make every great novel. So when I sat down to write blade of the destroyer which is now um dark blade assassin i was like okay i'm gonna go to the opposite extreme now story i can figure out i'm gonna spend a lot of time researching this character that i want to write and i knew i wanted to write an assassin so it led me to research the psychology of assassins and that sort of led me down the rabbit hole of all sorts of psychological related things and now if you read my stories you'll find that psychology is a huge element in every one of them and so this sort of this comment that yeah, the story's great, but the characters aren't there in so many ways defined who I am as an author because now when I sit down to write a story, the first thing that I research is, okay, now who's this character that I'm writing? What is driving them? What's their psyche? Once I get that, the story, the adventure, the fights, the epic stuff, it all kind of shapes itself around them. That is, gosh, that is an excellent example because, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to make the assumption that there's a little bit of Andy in those characters that your early reviewers were saying were, yeah, and they're all right. <laughs> right. So pers on you a know, personal level that had, especially early in your, in your career, that had to be a, you know, a little tough to take. It, de Oh man, it was one of the hardest things I had ever, like getting those reviews. It, it, it was almost disheartening. It was disheartening. It was almost depressing. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, you know, I, I developed a bit of a thick skin because I have a very critical uh, brother who is one of my alpha readers. And so he had given me a lot of critical notes and I was like, all right, to make this work, I'm going to have to learn to suck it up. And so I had gotten through, but it was still pretty tough. You know, it really made me doubt myself mm -hmm. all the way up until Blade of the Destroyer was released. And I started getting the, the feedback and people were like, man, this is such a fascinating look into the psyche of an assassin, which is exactly what I had wanted. And, and so it was definitely, it could have derailed me, but I'm so glad that I got that because it's made my stories a thousand times better ever since. That is awesome. And folks, if you don't feel your chest swell, that that story that you've got on your drive right now or on your phone, maybe you're, you're punching it out on your phone. I don't know. But if you don't feel that chest swell of empowerment that you can do it from that story. I, I don't know what I can do for you anymore at this point. <laughs> if, if, I mean, he put the, Andy puts that out in the world. People tell him, eh, your character's all right. Nothing great. The story's interesting, you know, uh, to, to be where you are now, Andy, that is such an awesome story and a story of perseverance. And that's what I love about bringing folks like you on because that lifts everybody. You know, I think that's actually one of the common themes in my books. 
is like I, I I've actually find this probably almost too repeated is that the character finds himself in an impossible situation and they're like well I've got no choice either I do what I need to do or I die and that perseverance that grit is what gets them yep. out mm-hmm. of the situation and I think that's probably the part of me that ends up filtering into my characters the most is that no matter how bad things get there's this certain perseverance that's going to get you out of it one way or another the three-year-old in the tree right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh, Okay. With, with that being said, I mean, I know we've mentioned it a couple of times um, or, or your work a couple of times, but I would really like to give you an opportunity to highlight maybe a series or a book or maybe even something that you've got coming up that you would like to folks to know about. For sure. You know, let's let's do the, the Hero of Darkness series, at least to begin. Hero of Darkness is about an assassin. He's actually all three things that are that are bad guys, classic villains. He's an assassin. He kills people for a living. He's half demon. And he has an accursed dagger that drives him to kill. So you've got you got a villain right there on your hands. But uh, I actually started writing him as a means of saying, okay, how can I take this villainous character and make him someone that people would love, that they would root for? And so the whole journey is his journey from becoming this straight up killer to a killer, but with a little bit more of a conscience. And so the the story of hero of darkness is that there's this assassin who has no idea who he is. He calls himself the hunter. It's the only name he's ever known. And, and he kills for a living, but he finds himself drawn into this deep, dark battle against ancient demons. And he finds out that he's the descendant of demons. And so he, he's got, it's this, this journey, one man's journey to find himself, to find his past, to find out who he is, his place in a world where he doesn't belong. And that really mirrors um, not only my struggle to find my place in the world, but mm-hmm. so many people. You know, we're all outcasts in our own little way. We've got to find our pack, the people who who connect with us, who make us feel like we belong. And so being able to write this character's journey and hearing that people say, you know, I really identified with this, uh, with this character the the struggle it makes me feel more a part of a pack at large because so many people are identifying with the same thing that i am therefore we've got something in common therefore we're now friends right. <laughs> <laughs> and and so hero of darkness introduced this world the world of Ainan, and all of my stories for not only now but the stories that i plan to write in the foreseeable future will all be set in this world, maybe at different times, but with all with connections to each of the other stories. So the, the, the hero of darkness came first. Then there was the, the queen of thieves series and it's set in, in a nearby city. And there's a lot of crossover between the two uh, stories where the character from one shows up in the other. In fact, the thief steals the alchemical sort of, clay that the hunter the assassin uses as his masks for disguise and he's the she's the one who ultimately is the reason that he has it and so it's just sort of fun ways sort of like how marvel comics you know they they make the captain america show up in the x-men or wolverine right. show up in the <laughs> avengers i loved that and so i wanted to do that in my worlds <laughs> it is neat to have crossover it, it can be it, you know if you're if you are a fan of a world like that and you get that crossover. Yeah. It can take, it, it can take a story to a whole completely different level. Totally. And it was actually one of my, one of the most spine tingling moments when I figured out a way to make the thief, the reason that the hunter goes against the bad guys in his book. And so she's ultimately responsible for everything that happens to him because of one action. She hires him to kill someone. <laughs> and it was just like, it was such a, such an interesting thing. Like, Holy crap, I can make this work. And then in the seventh book of the hero of darkness series, it's an actual crossover where he goes to her city and it's from both of their point of views. And so it's this, the classic superhero team up, you know, where they go to the same place. There's a misunderstanding they fight each other they go their separate ways they find out they need to work together they team up and they take down the bad guy it was just such a such a wonderful moment to write one of these classic superhero teams up in the context of a fantasy story with a thief and assassin <laughs> right as sort of your your detective noir characters <laughs> yeah it really i mean you're you're really mixing and you know that's exactly what i think is so attractive about it because it does it it, it puts the grime on hollywood superheroes in a way, you know, they're they're not the sexy, um, you know, clean, just virtuous people 
at least externally, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. But you, you still have them doing those virtuous things. That that is totally awesome. Um, Andy, at at this point, I, I want to thank you for everything that you've uh, shared with folks about your own journey, but the way you delivered it to to so that folks can believe in themselves that they can achieve as well, whether or not they want to become a hardcore writer themselves. But even if it's just to get that short story done, that they can do it. Now that they've fallen in love with you, they want to hear more about your books. They want to find out more about you. Where can they find you on the internet? Yeah. So basically everywhere you can find me is, uh, is as Andy Peliquin. My Facebook page is Andy, Andy Peliquin. My website is andypeliquin.com. I'm on Amazon as Andy Peliquin. And I want to say just one small thing sure. to anybody who is, who is thinking about writing or who is struggling through writing or is loving writing, whatever it is, that the one thing that we all connect with in stories is hopefulness. We want there to be a happy ending. We want there, even if there's not a happy ending, to be an ending where there is a sense of hopefulness. So hang on to that. Cling to that hopefulness that even if things suck now, even if you're struggling now, you'll get through it. And write that into your stories because that's what readers, that's what's going to make people say, yes, this was a story that I wanted to read that makes me feel good. And that feeling good is exactly what makes readers connect with your stories. That beautiful. That is beautiful. I, folks, I'm not going to add anything to that except for expressing my gratitude to Andy for coming on and sharing this part of his journey with us. Andy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Suck less.